Good evening. Welcome to the How To Academy. I'm Robin Ince and uh, I'll just tell you a couple of things about uh, what we're going to do this evening. This evening I'm going to have uh, a conversation with uh, David Nutt and then uh, I'll also be taking uh, questions from you as well. So if you have any questions, you'll probably get a message coming up in a moment uh, and uh, any questions throughout the evening, then we'll do them all towards the end. But thank you very much for joining us. We're going to be talking about this book, Cannabis Seeing Through the Smoke, which is uh, basically an evidence-based look at cannabis and uh, the problems that we have in uh, society, which is very often the loudest voices, sometimes the most monetized voices, are not those which are interested in evidence based. In fact, one of the shocking things in the book is just to read the UK is now one of the most backward countries in the world when it comes to cannabis. Uh, David, good evening. Good to speak to you. I wanted to start off by that there's so much to deal with in this book. I mean, for, for a book that is not that many pages, it has a huge amount of information and, and, you know, information that you can check. And it seems to me, as you said, that there is still in our public discourse, the moment drugs are mentioned, the moment illegal drugs are mentioned, the shutters are down. It's seen as to even suggest that cannabis might be useful is, 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 a, is a truly immoral position for for some people so I wanted to start off just by asking you you know why is it so important because one of the interesting things in terms of how cannabis can can be used you you, you talk about the stories of treatment resistant epilepsy and I wonder if you could tell me one of the one of the stories of just how important it's been for some people with treatment resistant epilepsy yeah well this is really one of the reasons I got interested in the whole question of of cannabis as a medicine and it, I mean, there these uh, these two young lads, um, Billy Caldwell and Arfie Dingley, who have severe treatment resistant epilepsy, which means essentially they're having seizures all the time and they're in hospital, often as many days as they're not. And um, and both of their mothers uh, were desperate to find treatments, and they, they've been on multiple different anticonvulsant drugs. You know, they've been given the every treatment that people could think of, and and they didn't work. And the mothers hunted down literature, largely uh, case studies, uh, like Charlotte Figgy, the Charlotte's Web Girl in the States, where it would be shown that um, the medical cannabis could help her epilepsy. And when I started to hear about this, I, I'd been interested in cannabis because I've been interested in drugs for a long time and went back to the literature and discovered that the, um, the British doctor, actually Irish doctor, O'Shaughnessy, who brought cannabis to Britain in the 1830s, brought it in from India because he had seen the value of medical cannabis treating epilepsy and tetanus in India. So he brought it to Britain and it was a medicine in Victorian times and Queen Victoria used it. And uh, it was particularly useful for infantile spasms. Uh, but of course it got banned in 1971 as a medicine for largely political reasons we can come back to. But it just seemed to me kind of interesting, isn't it? That, so mothers are finding a treatment for their children, which is working. But they have to live overseas in order to get it. So the Caldwells went to Canada and lived in Canada and the, the Dingleys went and got their um, treatment in, in Holland. And then when they came back to Britain, the medicine would be taken from them. And I mean, how iniquitous is that? You know, you've got trouble. Being a mother of someone with serious epilepsy is extremely distressing. And then you find a solution and then you find the government just removes it. And, and, and why do they do that? They do that because the law is completely stupid. The law on cannabis is, has, you know, doesn't have any intellectual underpinning at all. So we've been campaigning for well, almost six years now to trying to get that reversed. And the sad thing is we have reversed it. Cannabis is now a medicine in Britain, but it's not reimbursed by the NHS. So, so yes, they can get their medicine for their children in Britain, but they now have to pay huge amounts of money. They're, they're paying on average over a thousand pounds a month for, for um, maintaining the wellness of their children. Well, We've done a survey now of 21 children, and all of them had had dramatic benefits, but at the cost for almost all the parents are paying huge amounts of money and, uh, and often, you know, having to mortgage their house and, or, or sell their property in order to keep their children functioning, which seems to me just, it's really cruel, frankly. And, and in the book, you cover quite a few other conditions where there's different levels of evidence, but also looking at things like arthritis, looking at dealing with uh, some of the side effects of, uh, of, of chemotherapy as well. That's right. Well, cannabis has been licensed. The, the, the active ingredient in, uh, in there are two active ingredients in medical cannabis. One is THC, the stoning agent, and the other is cannabidiol. And, and um, 
THC has been a medicine in Britain actually for a long time. It's called Nabilone, and it's uh, and it has been used to help people deal with nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy, and, and also helping people with wasting diseases like like AIDS to put on a bit of weight. Uh, so that's it's been around, but it's probably not as good as medical cannabis. So that's the pure form of THC. But what we're discovering now is that if you take whole plant cannabis, you get both the THC, the cannabidiol, which is protective, and a range of other cannabinoids and other substances which seem to add value. We call it the entourage effect. It's a, the combination of those different elements of the plant seem to give you extra efficacy and also better side effect profile. And that's why we're trying to move away from the synthetic nabilone to the to the natural uh, medical cannabis. But there seems to also be a resistance from, you know, within the medical profession. And, and you, you, you quote Chris Whitty as saying that, you know, he, he was worried that if you if you extend availability of medical cannabis, then we might risk being in another situation like uh, a thalidomide in, in the uh, in the 1960s. Yeah, I was very, very disappointed in that statement. That was the statement he made to the uh, Health Select Committee. Uh, and it, I just we. You know, the difference between thalidomide and cannabis is that cannabis has been a medicine for 6,000 years and there's never been a case of a child being born with short limbs. I mean, in fact, the evidence that cannabis, even heavy cannabis use in pregnancy causes much of a problem is, is not there. I don't recommend it, of course. But the, the fact is, you know, it is probably the world's oldest medicine. One of the things you, you may not know, I don't know if you read in the book, what it really touched me was that the Chinese pictogram for cannabis is the same as for anesthesia and they were the, they were using it about 4,000 years BCE you know, to treat a range of conditions in court also including sedation so it is probably the safest medicine ever known so to flag up the fact that we don't know if it's safe is absolutely absurd what he was really saying was we haven't done the trials that we insist on doing now with all with new medicines controlled trials where you have placebo and, and you have a different doses of the active ingredient. We haven't put it through the full big pharma process. And, and A, we don't need to. And B, you know, the reason the far big pharma isn't doing it is because the, the technicalities of um, getting what we call um, in, intellectual property patenting on a, on a, a plant is very, very difficult. The, Britain has never licensed a plant-based medicine. The Germans have about, I think about 40 herbal medicines on their pharmacopoeia. They're pretty good doctors, but we've never licensed it. So we have, we have a peculiar standard in Britain, which is only if you have the pure extract and you put it through a process which is only huge pharma could do because it's so expensive, will we allow a drug to be a medicine? And that is actually difficult to, um, antithetical to medical practice where medical practice is about trying to do the best for your patient not doing what big pharma has bothered to do because there's loads and loads of different ca cases uh, different med different illnesses a term of which i touch on in in, in the book but they will never be studied by big pharma because there's not enough profit in it so like the Ehlers danlos syndrome the, like the, the wonderful example of lucy a, a, a woman and there are quite a few women in britain with Ehlers danlos syndrome who are using medical cannabis extremely effectively she's gone from being in intensive care because she couldn't swallow to being at university walking with crutches just because of medical cannabis uh, and that transformation has happened in about three years uh, and yet she, again her, her consultant wants her to have it on the nhs but the health authority says no there's no evidence it works and you think well hang on what evidence could ever convince you you can't say take someone out of intensive care and you put them to university and what more evidence would you want is it no controlled trials and you think that's just so silly because every time you every time you prescribe a doctor prescribes for a person they're doing a trial they're saying will this medicine help you and if it does great how much is your i mean because Obviously, for a lot of people, you really came on the radar with the, the equity where you, you compared, you know, the dangers of horse riding and the dangers of taking ecstasy. And, and that, that was, you know, quite a trial by fire in terms of seeing the psychology of people, seeing the way that people can can stir up, a, 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 a you know, again, non-evidence based, really non-informed rage that comes. In. Has that do you have you now found new methods in terms of thinking how can i get the evidence based the actual science across the reality across when this is an area which in whichever area of drug research is being done there are people who their rage is their immediate reaction to it 
Well, uh, yeah, I don't, getting people to think rationally is quite challenging. I think science is useful, science is helpful. Programs like yours are great for discussing science. I'm moving now more towards the economic argument because the, if we look, if you think sensibly about drug policy, it's not only doesn't it, it doesn't work, it also is very expensive to perpetuate and it causes a lot of harm. So if you look, take cannabis as an example, you know, we, had, we have tried in this country to stop people using cannabis. And we've done that by blocking importation from countries like Morocco and Lebanon relatively successfully. Well, what happened? People started growing their own, but they didn't grow Moroccan cannabis, they grew skunk. So they grew a much more toxic form of cannabis and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Cannabis, skunk is more harmful than traditional herbal or resin cannabis. And skunk only exists because we tried to get rid of the less harmful form. It would be like, as we saw with, with alcohol prohibition, prohibition, if you ban alcohol, what people drink is the strongest form because it's the it's the most cost-effective way of distributing an illegal drug, and and we persevered in Britain trying to stop prisoners smoking cannabis. And what happened? Then we started getting synthetic cannabinoids. We, people started making these really super potent cannabinoids, which have never been tested on humans before, except when they go to prisons. And now we've got sixty to one hundred prisoners a year dying. Well, no one's ever died on cannabis, but we'd, we've driven them because we've prosecuted them for using cannabis. We've driven them to things which can't be easily detected and, and which are much, much more harmful. So cannabis is a much more of a problem now because we've got to get rid of herbal cannabis than it ever was. Synthetic highs. I find that very interesting because the, there's a friend of mine who's, who's a very regular drug user and has been throughout his, his whole life. And the only uh, bad reaction he said he's ever had was he once thought i'm just going to try one of these legal highs yeah he said he spent a week where he became in his mind entirely detached from his bodily self mm -hmm. and i and i've seen him take all and I, and I found that you know so, so what is going on with the things like the receptors at that point in, right. in the brain what what is what is causing this very different reaction well the first thing to, to, to emphasize is that your brain is loaded with receptors for cannabis it's a bit of a surprise when that was discovered about 30 years ago, uh, because people, people assumed that cannabis was a drug. That, but it turns out that, that <clears throat> particularly the brain, but other organs make substances which work on cannabis receptors. In fact, there are more cannabis receptors in your brain than there are receptors for the neurotransmitters that people know about. Together, dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, add them all up. There's more cannabis receptors. And that tells us that, that they're important. They, they wouldn't be there if they weren't. And it explains why cannabis works, because cannabis stimulates the receptors. Now, you know, working back from the discovery of those receptors, we've discovered substances which are released from neurons that work on those receptors and do a lot of important things. They, it's a kind of homeostasis. It's kind of keeping the brain in equilibrium. Synthetic cannabinoids target the same receptors but they are just so much more potent. So it's a bit like, well, we've given the analogy already between beer and say spirits, but it's actually much more like the difference between codeine, which is a relatively weak painkiller, but an opiate receptor uh, stimulant, and fentanyl, which might be a thousand times more potent. And if you're pitching a system with a, that much more oomph, then it's not surprising it goes out of kilter because it's never met anything as powerful as that before. So in terms of the worries, I, I would say it, it, in the press, one of the most common things that, that we see is, is a connection between the use of cannabis and schizophrenia. Um, so what, what do we know uh, about that connection? Well, we know that a lot of people who have schizophrenia have used cannabis. But we also know that the majority of people who use cannabis don't have schizophrenia. So that tells us is, there's no way there's an inevitability to it. That's the first thing we know. Second thing we know is that quite a lot of people who have schizophrenia use cannabis, even though it seems to make their schizophrenia worse. And that is really interesting. And it's not because they're dependent. It's not because they have to use cannabis. It's because cannabis somehow helps them deal with some aspects of their psychosis. So it makes some things worse. It makes, often makes the voices worse. But it, when you talk to, as I do with my patients who with schizophrenia, why they smoke cannabis, you say because 
It helps them relax. It helps them sleep. It helps them actually think more openly. With schizophrenia, people get locked into think thought processes, which can be repetitive and, and, and really quite challenging. It helps them think in a much more open way. They can enjoy music and things a bit better. So, the, so there are benefits and downsides and they're, they're trying to essentially create that, you know, that equilibrium between the good and the bad. But then there's another really fascinating angle to it, which has only come out recently with the ability to do genome sequencing on a large scale. It, it turns out that um, genes which predispose to using cannabis or becoming dependent on cannabis are similar genes that predispose to schizophrenia. So we're now reformulating the theory that actually there may be a, a genetic tendency to both disorders with a similar set of genes. And that's quite interesting because it could be that the endogenous cannabis system somehow has got something to do with psychosis. And there are, there are people, there's a guy in Germany who thinks actually cannabis is protective in schizophrenia. In fact, particularly the cannabidiol, the non-stoning aspects of, of medical cannabis, they're being trial, trialed to treat schizophrenia with a little, you know, not massive success, but with some success. Yeah, I also found it interesting that the fact that what might surprise some people is that uh, cannabis can be used uh, against anxiety. Whereas I think people's presumption would be that, and, and I do know that some people will experience anxiety after cannabis use. But again, that that's in terms of, um, I mean, is this what really drew you to it? It's psychopharmacology, isn't it? That's the that's is, right. absolutely yes. Yeah. It's the uh, which I should get a definition of actually because I see sometimes these reports and it says a psychopharmacology report and I have to admit it's taken me twenty minutes to actually get the nerve to even risk attempting to say <laughs> it because I always th there's a couple of cab cannab yeah I'm not even going to try there's certain terms in your book that I always know when I do things like this I'll trip right over them but but th that were you particularly you know you're initially being drawn into this area is it because by understanding these drugs we really do get a a, a, a greater understanding of the brain as a whole whether for drugs drug users or not of of kind of at times what appears to be evolved purpose well absolutely so you know i mean I, what is the brain well the brain i would say the brain is a chemical organ everyone thinks of the brain as an electrical organ because uh, you when you measure things in the brain usually you're using something like an EEG, you're measuring electric activity, yes. Elect the neurons in the brain produce electricity and electricity transmits, uh, moves along the, the nerve cells in the brain. But to get to the next nerve cell, you have to release a chemical. And we estimate there are at least 80 different chemicals in the brain which communicate between nerve cells. And we don't even know all of them, you know, we, we, but we've identified you know, a good 60 or so, we suspect there are others. So the brain is a chemical organ uh, and the neurotransmitters, as we call them, that works between the different neurons, you know, they're small molecules which look like drugs. And if you want to inquire about what a neurotransmitter is doing, you have generally have to give a, another molecule that looks a bit like it called a drug, either to stimulate it or to block it. So drugs are really the key to understanding the chemical nature of the brain. 